2.1.1. Having established somewhat by the end of part one of the simple machine underwater, the contours of the shore I found myself washed up on when I decided to discontinue my single-minded pursuit of publishing the first novel I completed, I now intend to investigate the various ways I may have made myself vulnerable to the anguish that resulted. At the midpoint of the path through life I found, myself lost in a wood so dark the way, the head was blotted out the keening sound. I still make show so hard it is to say, how harsh and bitter that place fell to me, merely to think of it renews the fear, so bad that death by only a degree could possibly be worse. 2.1.2 Don't think I imagine I'm the only person who ever found himself in such a situation. 2.1.3 Just look at Dante. 2.1.4 Imagine how many since then have felt the same way. 2.1.5 Look at how perfectly he captured the feeling and with just those few words. 2.1.6 Forgive me if it takes the machine a few more words than it took Dante to process the experience. 2.1.7 It wasn't the first time I felt this way, the feeling I had when I failed to publish my folio. And in fact, I even employed the same phrase to describe it then that I did just now, when I use the figure of being washed ashore. 2.1.8 The ocean has always been a central metaphor in my writing, so much so that you'd think I would have spent more time in it, but it's not as if I'm a sailor or a scuba diver or a surfer or really anything more than a person who grew up on an island and likes to spend time at the beach. 2.1.9 It's a fertile image, the ocean, since it's a place where you can be overwhelmed by the churning of a wave or the pull of the undertow be tossed about in rough seas, where you can be as alone as it's po probably possible to be without leaving Earth's atmosphere. And it's also a world full of mystery, with so much going on below you, unseen, hardly even intuited, which of course makes it a powerful metaphor for the determinative but ungrasped as aspects of the psyche. But at the same time, and in the case of the washed ashore metaphor I'm contemplating, the sea is a thing that can at times hold us up, that's dangerous but survivable, a place where we can negotiate with a force almost infinitely greater than us, where we can seek a proper balance between resistance and surrender to such a force. 2.1.10 In the metaphor of being washed ashore as I'm using it in these two instances, it's the land I'm washed ashore upon that is troubling and alien and desolate, implying that the sea that had been carrying me along was where I felt at home. And this seems to point to a period during which I felt though I couldn't have put words to it until it went away, allowing me to see it for something approaching what it was, that I was more or less successfully negotiating that balance between resistance and surrender. 2.1.11 I had a few years earlier felt washed ashore at my parents' house, the house I grew up in, a place that is always welcoming but was sadly by that stage in my life no longer home. After a period of time during which I was able, somehow, to string together a series of artist residencies, a few fellowships, semesters of teaching, and interludes of couch surfing, as I pursued the writing that I anticipated, without knowing the precise mechanism, would be the key to my finding something more settled, a situation in which I might feel at home. But the opportunities dried up before this new situation revealed itself. When we refuse what has been offered to the empty heart, when possible futures are given and not acted upon, then the imagination recedes. And without the imagination, we can do no more than spin the future out of the logic of the present. We will never be led into new life because we can work only from the known. 2.2.1 Was it actually impatience or alarm that led to my decision to arrange accommodations in Minneapolis, rather than the rational evaluation colored by a splash of faith that I imagined it was at the time. 2.2.2 Am I using the same metaphor to describe these two different situations because I'm lazily reaching for a familiar image or because the image genuinely reflects the two experiences? 2.2.3 
Am I in a position to discern the difference? And even if I were, would it be all that helpful? Don't think I imagine I'm the only person who ever found himself in such a situation. 2.2.4 I believe I felt that fortune had taken me as far as it could and discipline would have to carry me for a stretch when I decided to choose a place to live after more than five years when I'd only had a place to sleep. Which isn't to say that discipline hadn't been a necessary contributor during that period of good fortune, because it had, or I felt it had, but it hadn't yet had to be the primary generator of the power that would move me from aspiring to achieving unpublished to published, unsettled to settled. 2.2.5 now we've just about come to the point I described in part one, because within a few months of moving to Minneapolis, I started writing notes from underwater, during which I doubled down on the discipline and went a little too light to be clear-eyed about it on the settling in, partly due to the fact that I was broke, partly due to a com combination of other factors that would have been inconsequential taken separately, but in the aggregate brought on disquietude. But most importantly, because it felt like once I finished this book, the transition from unpublished to published and so from aspiring to achieving would be realized and the transition from unsettled to settled would follow more or less naturally. So there was no need to press, not in that department anyway. 2.2.6. There are disparate ingredients that insist on being included in the mix if I'm going to arrive at all in the vicinity of my intention which is why it seems imperative to rectify for the tighter emphasis on the writing of notes from underwater and my inability to publish it that I submitted in the first installment by giving the more expanded perspective of my existence and experience that the machine has been pressing me to impart so far, so far in this one. And I suppose I could describe these other considerations as what lies in the interval between life and book, why, or maybe only how, I put myself in a position in which an individual book was meant to justify the living of a life. Perhaps even how I substituted living through my imagined or projected book and through books in general for living my life. 2.2.7 For instance, I began to feel the accumulated weight of the opportunities I'd been given as an obligation that could only be made good on by publishing a book that would testify to the generosity and good sense of the numerous individuals and institutions that have supported me through the first decade of my writing life, or to put it in words closer to those I would have used at the time, by publishing a book that would justify their having shown faith in me. 2.2.8 There was a more personal reckoning that needed to be faced as well, which had to do with finding myself approaching 40 with no money saved, no career established, no children or family of my own, no home I felt at home in, all of which items in retrospect represent the ante and then the escalating stakes I waged on the ambition that distilled into something along the lines of creating a worthwhile piece of art. And as my wager grew more dear, the payout that could warrant having ventured it had no alternative but to grow commensurately more valuable. 2.2.9 One really oughtn't speak of these things as the gods might be listening or the fairy folk, tricksters ever and always in search of a plan to foil, or your neighbors might hear it, and while the successfully ambitious may be celebrated on occasion, having openly aimed high and admittedly come up short always comes across as unseemly, evidence that you didn't know your place, that you reached above your station, maybe even that you thought you were better than the rest, whereas unconfessed failures to achieve unaired ambitions can be happily ignored by all parties. In the last stream I think I had, I was at a, uh, I don't know exactly, a writer's residency, but not but a conference, I guess. But small, not AWP size, smaller than that. And, uh, you know, I'm as uncomfortable in those things as I always am. I'm trying to find my place, feel like I belong, even though I haven't published a book. And... I'm hanging out with Charlie Baxter. I feel like I'm riding him a little bit, but I don't know what, what for. He, and I feel like he's maybe a little impatient with me. There's someone else there, but I don't know if they're a real person that I actually know or if they're just like, like an idea of a person. But Charlie 
picked up. Oh, and there was a lot of stuff. Now I'm remembering a little more. We're at a table eating and we're with um, with someone who was like not not really a big deal or not a big deal in my opinion, but was but thought they were a big deal and was like in this whole like economy of of uh, autographs was like and people would come up to like whatever and he'd be like uh, of course you want an autograph or I'm sure you want I'm sure you'd like an autograph and people would be polite and say of course and then so there was this whole weird economy of that I had one and then I when we left I forgot at the table um there was a sports writer who uh I think tried to give me an autograph or he maybe give me a pen to give to this other guy. I don't know if this other guy was a real person or not. Two point two point ten. A thing I haven't mentioned is that as I felt myself growing as an artist, I experienced increasing difficulty getting published or winning grants and fellowships, almost in inverse proportion, which had the effect of throwing me back upon myself as I rejected the world that was rejecting me. It's all spiritual. Two point three point one. Why is it taking me so long to get to the gift? Lewis Hyde's redemptive book. 2.3.2 Is it because in describing it I risk oversimplifying and underselling it when what I really want is for everyone to read it? For Whitman, the self becomes the gifted self, prolific, green, when it recognizes the stuff of its experience, its talents, and the products of its labor to be gifts, endowments. And the work of the artist can only come to its powers in the world when it moves beyond the self as a gift from the artist to his audience or in its wider functions as that image-making work whose circulation preserves the spirit of the collective and slowly accrues a culture, a tradition. 2.3.3 a work of art should be seen as a gift rather than a commodity. 2.3.4 The artist is born with and nurtures the gifts associated with creativity. Gift, noun, common Germanic, Old English, gift, strong feminine, recorded only in the sense payment for a wife, and in the plural with the sense wedding. Corresponds to Old Frisian, jeft, feminine, gift. Middle Dutch, gift. Dutch, gift, feminine. Gift. Gift, neuter. Now more commonly, gif, poison. 2.3.5. The artist receives the gift of inspiration to create a particular work of art. 2.3.6. The artist applies their in innate gifts to the muse's gift to create the piece of art. 2.3.7. The work of art is offered as a gift to the public or some portion of it. 2.3.8 Each step is marked by an increase in the worth of the gift. 2.3.9 The quality of a gift is that it is fertile. It leads to increase. 2.3.10 the thing about a gift is it has to be freely offered and freely received. 2.3.11 What might happen with a gift that doesn't circulate is its fecundity could cross over into putrefaction. A gift that cannot be given away ceases to be a gift. The spirit of a gift is kept alive by its constant donation. If this is the case, then the gifts of the inner world must be accepted as gifts in the outer world, if they are to retain their vitality. Where gifts have no public currency, therefore, where the gift as a form of property is neither recognized nor honored, our inner gifts will find themselves excluded from the very commerce which is their nourishment, or to say the same thing from a different angle, 
Where commerce is exclusively a traffic in merchandise, the gifted cannot enter into the give-and-take that ensures the livelihood of their spirit. 2.3.12 This was where I was, with this gift I had created it and wanted to pass along, an offering that, in order for me to make, had to be received by the world or some portion of it, but which was instead stuck in place, its natural increase stifled, its fertility thwarted, rotting inside me. When I came across a parenthetical comment in a book by Kenneth Burke that brought with it a sudden stark enlightenment. Imagery, as confessional, contains in itself a kind of personal irresponsibility. As we may even relieve ourselves of private burdens by befouling the public medium. If our unburdening attains an audience that has been socialized by the act of reception, in its public reception, even the most excremental of poetry becomes exonerated. Hence the extreme anguish of a poet who writing with maximum efficiency under such an aesthetic does not attain absolution by the suffrage of customers. 2.4.1 Was this the real reason I had so acutely needed my gift to be accepted? Because I had put shit out into the world, and it would remain shit until it was redeemed by the transformational attention of a reading public. 2.4.2 When Nabokov had tried, why hadn't I let him warn me off my task? 2.4.3 Hadn't I known, even as I wrote my novel, that the narrator was plodding through the sewer of his own and our collective soul? 2.4.4 what if, despite my caution, in spite or because of the machine, I'm doing the very same thing right now? But at the end, I don't know if I was staying at Charlie's or just going to his place or something, but he had to pick up some stuff or some stuff had arrived, and one of them was this sheer green dress shirt you could see through so you'd see his nipples and stuff Charlie would never wear um, and, and, and something's just out of my reach is something about like the man of the forest or the, the green man and it's a, it's a symbolic kind of you know regenerative vegetal whatever um, and maybe there was a play being put on or, the, or we could use this shirt if we did put on a play or they were putting on a play the shirt had nothing to do with it but we could use it something like that 2.4.5 working here in the cleavage that arises from the pursuit of truth within the dictates of arbitrary form which is the nature of at least this machine operator pairing conscious that this lecture is going long i continue to envision just at the end of the next stratum ever ahead yet never approaching the lesson or wisdom I intimated last time might be found in this lecture, and which one hopes is the culmination of this kind of endeavor. 2.4.6 Wisdom often starts with an observation, and sometimes an observation can pass as a reasonable facsimile for wisdom. And I don't know which I'm trying to offer now, but all I can see when I look back at what I've been going on about is words piled atop sentences, piled atop books, piles on top of piles, mountains of words as far as the mind's eye can see. And all these words, sentences, and books sending me down into despair and pulling me up out of it, compelling me to trade hours of totally livable life to spend on their appreciation, on their cultivation, persuading me that these traded hours will be worth it, or maybe that they are worth it, they just are even when it's a bad day of writing or a frustrating day of reading. 2.4.7 Once I get there, I'm pretty sure I've gone too far, since a bad day of writing can be pretty bad. But I don't want to go too far the other way either, comparing writing to some savage and vengeful god demanding its sacrifice of time and misery, 
because one of the few things I know is that the words are perfectly uninterested in my happiness or misery as long as I serve them. But I guess we all have to live for something, and this seems to be my thing. Though I'd be lying if I said I wasn't still hoping it would pay off somehow, if I said I'd finally accepted the lesson of the Bhagavad Gita, that we have the right to our labor, but not to the fruits of our labor. But I also can't see what payoff would satisfy me at this point, what kind of fruit it would take to justify these labors. And I remember what Leonard Cohen told me in a dream when he said it's all a spiritual struggle. And I believe that that's true, and I can feel that I'm struggling. But more than that, I can't really say. So I'll give Annie Dillard the last word and hope she was onto something. There is no shortage of good days. It is good lives that are hard to come by. A life of good days lived in the senses is not enough. The life of sensation is the life of greed. It requires more and more. The life of the spirit requires less and less. Time is ample and its passage sweet. Who would call a day spent reading a good day? But a life spent reading that is a good life. A day that closely resembles every other day of the past 10 or 20 years does not suggest itself as a good one. But who would not call Pester's life a good one? Or Thomas Mann's?